Hello, welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you. We're going to give you a minute or two to log on and please put in the chat um, your name, how long you've been a navigator and where you're from. We love to hear from you. So, so exciting to to be together again. Um, we have winter advisory warnings here in um, Southern, and I heard it's cold in no Northern California. So I think all of California is um, is winter advisory weather. So this is exciting, right? All of us on the same, same page. So um, again, type in the chat where you're from, how long you've been a navigator, and where you're from. We'd love to see if you're from California. I know we have some people joining us from um, other states. So very exciting today to get started. We have some great case studies and we are honored to have our special guest today. So um, we're gonna get started in probably another minute because we don't wanna waste any more time. So really, really exciting stuff here. So here it comes in the chat. You guys are talking, I love this. Well, hello everyone. We're gonna get started. And so welcome to our California Bridge case studies, ethical medical dilemmas. You guys are in witness this every single day. We wanted to take the opportunity for our mentors to kind of role play and show you how they, they tackle all of these successes and challenges, as well as we have doctors on today with us to um, help us out with the whole what we need to know about a fentanyl and microdosing. I know that comes up again and again, um, and we just want to make sure that you guys are aware of your role and what you need to know. Um, and if you have a question, please type it in the chat. One of our mentors will um, try to get back to you. If not, we will follow up, okay? We're gonna get started. Well, you know what California Bridge, our goal is access 24 seven, high quality treatment of substance use disorders in all California hospitals. Um, and we are well on our way. 280 hospitals have signed up. So you are in a very exclusive club that is growing to 280 um, hospitals strong. So we're really excited about this. We're as far north and as far south um, and we're just excited to have you today. Um, full disclosure: all of our um, all of our materials are available are available through Creative Commons, and we will um, if you request any type of materials. And so now we bring. I always, you know me, I always like to remind what the California Bridge model is. We're revolutioning the system of care. When we think back to 2019, when this got started, we've done so much in such a short amount of time. And part of that was because of you and doctors like Dr. Zahn that's here today. Um, it's been just pledged, plowing along, trying to get people on board. And we've gotten 280 hospitals giving low barrier treatment. That's what the docs do. The docs are administering, prescribing buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. The other two focuses, connection to care and community and culture of harm reduction are what you guys are doing. That's the navigator's role. So make sure you know our three focuses of our bridge model, low barrier treatment, that's the docs, um, doc, docs focus, and ours is the connection and link to care. We're bridging care to treatment options as well as changing culture, right? Fighting the stigma and biases um, from everyone, right? We know that that's a huge challenge. So that's our three focus um, thing today. These are our objectives. Um, this is for CEU and you will be given an evaluation link in our post event email. Um, so this is what we're learning today. And so our agenda, we have microdosing case study, telehealth and opiate use disorder case study, as well as a youth overdose. So we have all these wonderful um, presentations today. And I do want to just give an announcement and a shout out for it is Black History Month. So we always want to acknowledge um, our our uh, our monthly national day, uh, national month days for Black history. So there is our announcement. And we're going to go to 
case study number one, microdosing. But first, let me announce Dr. Zahn. Um, I'm honored because she was one of the first doctors that I talked to up in, I don't know if you remember Dr. Zahn in San Francisco um, before the pandemic started. So, so it seems like so long ago, right? 2020 is when I met Dr. Zahn and she is an emergency medicine physician in LA at California Hospital. Hospital Medical Center, as well as Southern California Permanent, uh, Permanente Medical Group. She is also our implementation leader, and she's been with us for four years now. Yeah. Many. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And she, uh, she, you know, I have to say she loves our navigators and she is one person I can always depend on when, um, when we need her to talk to you guys. She is so, such an advocate for you guys, navigators. You do not even know. So I am going to hand it over and um, Dr. Jennifer Zahn is with us in the house. Woo, woo. Hello everyone. Okay. So we're going to start with a little case study. And I'm sure many of you guys have seen a case like this. The patient's story goes like this. 25-year-old male patient comes into the ED, states he is in opioid withdrawal, but has no obvious signs. He is unclear about the last time he used M30s with fentanyl. He explains he takes half or quarter pills throughout the day, and it has been a few hours since the last use. So how many of you guys have seen a patient like this? I mean, probably all of you, right? Um, there's so many cases of uh, patients with intentional fentanyl use, and they tell you that they're, you know, they're microdosing um, fentanyl, and you realize, oh, this, you know, this isn't just like an accidental overdose. This is like intentional microdosing of fentanyl. So what do we do about this? I just have a, um, a few of my own slides that I wanted to share. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Can you guys see my slides? Okay, so WTF, what the fentanyl? Uh, fentanyl, just a brief overview, it's a synthetic opioid, right? It was designed back in the day as um, a medication in patches to help with chronic pain in cancer patients. It's stronger, it's more effective, and it has really high affinity to the opioid receptor, meaning very, very high potency. Um, and that's why it's at, it has a higher risk of overdose than some of the other opioids. Uh, and it, you know, in the past, we did not always test for fentanyl on urine drug screen. So, um, there, you know, there are specific fentanyl tests available, but not in every lab. So your urine drug screen might just come back positive for opioids, but you don't exactly know what the patient is using. The other thing about fentanyl is that it can build up in fat stores over time. So, you know, patients like store it in their body and it can take longer to have withdrawal symptoms. But when they do have withdrawal symptoms, it is severe just because of, you know, how potent this medication is. Um, so, so over time, if patients intentionally use such a potent opioid, they build tolerance, right? So, you know, you have your opioid receptors and if they're constantly working, then they build a lot of tolerance to opioids. And um, that's why, you know, the withdrawal can be even more severe when they stop using fentanyl. So fentanyl is such a big deal. You see it all, all over the news these days because it's often mixed with other drugs like heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine. And a recent DEA analysis of counterfeit pills showed that each tablet has such a variable amount of fentanyl. It could be anywhere from 0.02 milligrams up to five milligrams of fentanyl in one tablet. And that's because when they like, you know, when they mix the medications and um, distribute it in, into like you know, little tablets, they don't know exactly how much is going into each one. So it's highly variable. And over 42% of pills tested contain over two milligrams of fentanyl. And just to give you a perspective of, you know, how much fentanyl we give in the, in the hospital as a medical dose for pain, we give like 50 to 200 micrograms. So micrograms 
converted into milligrams is 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 milligrams. So if you can imagine if a pill contains like multiple milligrams of fentanyl, that is way above the lethal dose and it's super easy to overdose on this medication. And the drug trafficking is by the kilogram. So one kilogram of fentanyl in counterfeit pills can kill 500,000 people. Um, very dangerous. So fentanyl causes a lot of fear and it's uncertainty. And, uh, you know, we have to ask ourselves these questions, you know, do I still use buprenorphine in the same way? Um, what about Narcan? You know, what do I do? The takeaway today is to not overcomplicate things. Um, oftentimes patients tell you they're microdosing on fentanyl, but even a microdose of fentanyl, as you saw from the previous slide, could be a massive dose and more than we would ever use medically to treat pain. So if they're, you know, having opioid withdrawal symptoms from um, fentanyl use, they're not microdosing, they're full on dosing or even macro dosing. They just don't know it, right? Because, you know, if they're withdrawing, that means their system is building dependence and building tolerance to this medication. Um, so, you treat it the exact same way as any other use. Uh, so MAT works and you keep calm and start bup. Um, sometimes the withdrawal symptoms can take a little longer just because they store fentanyl in their you know, fat stores in the body. Um, so you tell the patients, you know, wait until you feel sick, wait until you're in moderate to severe withdrawal, and then start buprenorphine. So, you know, the patient in the case study today, he used a couple hours ago and didn't have active withdrawal symptoms. So that's a patient you can say, you know, come back when you're feeling sick or try take home buprenorphine. And here's how you start it when you do feel sick. In terms of the dosing, um, you know, we, we've seen that some because fentanyl withdrawal is so severe, oftentimes these patients need a higher dose, um, 16 milligrams, 24 milligrams to start. Now, not all providers are comfortable just like ordering that in one go. You could still tell them to follow the CA bridge protocol, give eight milligrams, wait 30 to 60 minutes, see how the patient feels. They're probably still going to have withdrawal symptoms. What do you do? Keep calm, give more bup, right? So then order another um, eight milligrams, see how they're feeling, wait 30, 60 minutes. And then if, if they're still feeling bad, just give more buprenorphine. Um, these patients have so much tolerance that even if you hit the max dose of you know, 32 milligrams a day, um, they, they can handle it. And guess what? It is way safer for them to be maxed out on buprenorphine and not have any risk of, you know, overdose or respiratory depression um, than to go out in the community and use fentanyl again. Let me know if you guys have any questions and uh, yeah, don't don't overthink it. Just keep calm, start bup, same way. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Zahn. I'm, you know, you, calm, you, you made me calm. You said it's like anything else, start the bup. How many of you guys thought it was more than that? Raise your hand, not gonna lie, come on, you know, let us know because type it in the chat if you have questions. This is your time. This is our doc to ask questions. And no question is dumb or stupid or anything. If you have a question and you, you're thinking about something, chances are somebody else is. And I love the fact that she said, just keep it simple. Use our BUP algorithm. I know Chaya has put that in the chat. And um, right now, I know we get lots of questions about fentanyl and microdosing and now macrodosing. Um, if you, you know, have any questions and we're, Dr. Zahn's always around. So definitely, if you have one, I have a question. How do I get doctors more comfortable with a higher prescription for buprenorphine? How do we do, do that, Dr. Zahn? Yeah, so it, it's just changing the culture, right? And um, you can always let them chat with the warm hotline, the MAT hotline or substance abuse hotline. Sometimes, you know, docs just need to talk to 
a an addiction medicine specialist so they feel more comfortable doing it if it's their first time um, but um, it's just a matter of explaining that you know, patients with with fentanyl or chronic opioid use they have such a high tolerance and they upregulate their receptors so when they go into withdrawal they they might need more buprenorphine than a regular person yeah, you brought up a great point. Um, I'm going to see if somebody can put in the chat the hotline. Okay, there's the warm line. So for those um, navigators that need help um, and need need some coaching from uh, for our doctors, you can use the warm line. And I've done dial the number here, doc. Here's another doctor from UCSF that will talk to you about buprenorphine. It's a great, great tool um, because they won't pick up the phone themselves. Most of the time, call them on your phone and say, hey, I have Dr. You know, Zahn and she's going to talk to our doctor and just make that make that bridge. Definitely. Um, I have another question. What if you do? What do you do if you put someone to uh, precipitate a withdrawal with fentanyl? What's the answer to that, Dr. Zahn? The same as precipitated withdrawal from any opioid. Um, so if it's under treated withdrawal, that, that's a little different than precipitated withdrawal. Um, under treated withdrawal, you give more buf. You continue treating the withdrawal. For precipitated withdrawal, like say you know someone overdosed on fentanyl and you gave um, naloxone and they just they feel horrible. Um, you know, give those patients buprenorphine as well, and you know that will slowly. Um, attached to their opioid receptors and help with those symptoms, but then you might need to give them some other medications just to help with the symptoms. So, um, you know, benzos, you can try like pain dose, low dose ketamine, um, clonidines, some of these other medications to treat precipitated withdrawal. All right, we have lots of questions about patients that are not in withdrawal, and I think these are varying answers. I would say if the patient um, has not used for weeks or months at a time and just wants to get back on Suboxone, that's not an emergency for the ED. Um, definitely, if they have a clinic, if you can refer them straight to a clinic or an inpatient, outpatient, um, it sounds like they need more than just a bup. Um, administration or prescription. So um, I'm going to hold off because a lot of these are just stating that, you know, they're not in withdrawal. Dr. Zahn already had explained, you can ask them to come back or you can give, if your physician feels comfortable to give the prescription to start at home. Um, so definitely those are different scenarios and we can definitely address those back to you, um, you know, at a later time. Thank you. We have so many questions and we need to be mindful of the other speakers and Dr. Zahn. I really, really appreciate you coming. You made it so simple. And I think a lot of us were very um, nervous when it came to that because it's such a, you know, microdosing, macrodosing, all of this. And, and remember you guys, you know, it's just keep calm and give boop. And definitely um, if you, you're, you need your physician to um, speak to somebody, use our warm hotline. That's what it's there for you guys. And there's always somebody who will call you back or answer. Very rarely do I, um, you know, they do answer. So, you know, sometimes it might, you leave a message and they'll call you back. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Zahn. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Lots of great questions in the chat. And, you know, we'll try to address some of those um, after just to give time for the other uh, panelists. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Zahn. And we will, we'll get back to you. There's just an overwhelming um, number of questions. So we need to move on. Um, we will put up the warm hotline number again. Um, we'll have, have our team do that definitely, as well as the BUP algorithm. Um, we'll put have that in the chat as well. Those are your two friends, right? Okay, we're going to get started and going back to our presentation. Let me get back online here. And next, we have our navigator mentors for case study number two. Um, I just wanted to remind you guys, 
all sites are not the same and treatment plans may be different at your facility. There's no right or wrong here. We're just allowing our navigators to share, share some case studies with you. Um, so definitely if you, again, if you have questions and you have your own uh, personal experience that you, you know, you needed some answers to share it in the chat and we will get back to you. I promise that somebody asked if we're going to share this PowerPoint. Yes, everything you will get a post event email and it will have the resources and the slide deck that we used here today. Okay, so we're going to get started. And I'm excited to, um, pre, uh, to announce that we have our mentors, LaToya Mitchell, Nicole Farley, and Wendy Martinez. So you guys are on next and they're going to present um they're going to do some role playing so i'm real quickly going to go over this because you're going to meet these the navigator and the patient um they have a whole role playing to do and this patient is penelope she's 35 year old female using fentanyl and heroin iv she started using after a car accident and she is just starting her withdrawal symptoms. So she's unable to get her drug of choice. And um, after much runaround, she's finally gotten to the navigator. Team, I'm gonna have you guys take it away. Ring, ring. Good morning, how can I help you? Hi, my name's Penelope. And um, I was wondering if anyone um, at your hospital could help me. I'm in, I'm starting to feel withdrawal symptoms from fentanyl. Um, I, I also use heroin. Um, and I'm just feeling really sick. Um, I can't get a hold of my dealer. Um, we're snowed in. And so I was just wondering if there is any way that someone at the hospital can help me. I've been transferred so many times. I just really need help. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, Penelope. I will be glad to help you. Uh, we want to make this as low barrier treatment and give you, make sure you have access to services. So uh, let's see what we can do. Um, you've been having withdrawal symptoms for how long? Um, I'm probably the last time I used was like six hours ago. Okay, okay. So what I'm going to do, since you're snowed in, I'm going to try to speak with one of our physicians here in the hospital to see if we can connect you with uh, services and or uh, get to the pharmacy. Do you have a pharmacy near you? Yeah, there's one like a block away right, right around the corner for me. I think I could get to it if I need okay. to. Okay, wonderful. What I'm going to do is um, have you speak with the doctor briefly. And in the meantime, I'm going to connect with the pharmacy to make sure that they have the buprenorphine the buprenorphine um, medication for you. Um, have you used that before? Are you familiar with Suboxone or anything like that? Yeah, I used it a long time ago for like a couple weeks and then I relapsed. Okay, wonderful. So in the meantime, I'm going to connect you with the physician and I'm going to call the pharmacy so we can get this ball moving, moving for you, okay? Thank you. All right, hang on. I'll connect you with the doctor. Ring, ring. Okay, she spent some time speaking with the physician. Um, I was able to connect with the pharmacy, Penelope. Wonderful. So they do have the medication available for you. Oh, that'll be great. So in do the I mean, just go and pick it up or what, what do I do? Yes. So you can just go pick it up. Uh, the pharmacy will give you some details and how to take it. In the meantime, I have your phone number because I looked up your information. So I'm going to take a snapshot of our uh, Suboxone self-start just to make sure that you have it with some detailed instructions. And also, um, I would like to connect you with our clinic, one of our clinics that are near you for uh, follow-up services. So I... Would, do you mind if I share your information with them? Yeah, that would be great. I think I, I need to I need to get back on um, more permanent um, treatment and okay. stay on Suboxone. I don't want to go through this again. Okay, so we're going to make sure we kind of link you to some care outside of that. And also, 
We don't know what this weather is going to do. So I wanna make sure that you have the county hotline number in the event that you cannot get in touch with myself or someone on our team, okay? Okay. And that number is 888-777-9311. Thank you so much. How, how soon can I go pick up that prescription? Uh, it should be ready for you within the next hour or two. Okay, thank you. That's it. That's it. Thank you, guys. So. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm um, really, I love that scenario. We already have some questions going in. And so we have, um, she has no insurance. How's she going to pay for it? Any question, any, any, anybody can answer this, including our navigators out there, right? I'm waiting. Any answers from our navigators? What would they do if the patient has no insurance? Offer her to sign up for Medi-Cal. Yep. What if medication is out? Nicole did call the pharmacy. That's why she, uh, one of the things that she did, what she said was she was going to. Um, each hospital is different, um, but I know there is, Xenia says they do telehealth. Um, and like I said, every every hospital is going to be different, you know, and, and my hospital too. They'll call the navigator. And if that patient was seen before, if we can verify that they were on Suboxone, it really matters does matter who the prescriber is as well. So we just wanted to give a, a general scenario. Um, Xenia offers great answer. Maybe a social worker can give a voucher. Awesome, yeah. What are- I'm gonna people? answer um, Bridget's question about um, someone picking up if they haven't signed up for Medi-Cal. Yes. Um, we have to assume that they were gonna pay for the drugs that they were gonna use. So maybe they can pay for a part of their prescription. And while they're getting approved for emergency Medi-Cal, once that they have their emergency Medi-Cal um, little paper or whatever, they can take that in and get the rest of their medication. Great. Great answer, definitely. Um, and we have some questions here. I'm gonna hand it over to Latoyo. Can we accept the patient's self-assessment of withdrawal? during a telehealth call? Yeah, so um, this really has to, the assessment has to be done by the physician. Um, so Nicole connecting the patient to the physician via telehealth is completely acceptable and is definitely the best route to go. Um, there are other factors that can play into this, but um, the good thing is that the, the physician will know, um, you know what's within their purview to, to take care of with the phone assessment. Great, great. And there's some other stuff coming in, some other questions. And one of those things is we've never seen it go that fast. Well, some of our providers will do this over the phone that are in your hospital. You just got to find out the providers that will do this. Definitely. Especially if the patient has been there before, um, you know, they might not require the patient to come in, but for, for everyone, if the patient has no money, no insurance, they they cannot be denied in the emergency room. So that's always the, the go-to answer is come to the emergency room um, because we cannot, uh, we have to treat them. So always remember that. Um, do we have to get hospital or doctor approval before doing a tele telehealth call? Well, in this case, there were the the roads were closed. There was nothing else during COVID. There was no restriction because of COVID. So we know um, during the whole COVID, telehealth was wide open. Um, I think as things are progressing more out of COVID, um, the pandemic. They may tighten down telehealth rules, but as of now, um, it it has gotten easier to do telehealth. Okay, yes, ED telehealth. We do it in my facility um, in Southern California for all behavioral health. That's what we use is telehealth for our our psychiatric uh, consultations. So yes, I know many of you probably are doing that as well. But every patient in our that has a behavioral health. Um, diagnosis receives a telehealth um, psych consult. So it is being, it is happening. Um, so it just depends. Again, 
all hospitals and all sites are different. And this is just a general role playing. Any other questions? Anything else from the team that you wanted to go over? Yeah, so there is a really good point in, in the chat, which is um, other telehealth uh, routes like Bright Heart Health, Work at Health. Uh, there's a few others. So you can always go that route as well. And some of them are able to get a prescription sent same day for the patient after the phone assessment. Um, and they can usually do it through a, um, a smart device and have like a kind of like a Zoom or something like that. Um, there's many options out there. So figure out what works for your site and, and you know, what you can kind of get going. But the other thing I want to ask the audience here, um, is what action steps would you take? So if you can drop in the chat box, um, because every site is different, um, and like Sherry says all the time, there is no right or wrong answer here. Um, so let us know what action steps you would take in this scenario for your patient, given um, you know what, what uh, you have going on at your hospital and, and what's set up with your process. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll we'll take a look at kind of some of the action steps that we took. All right, we're going to wait for you guys to put in some action steps here, like Latoya said. Um, that was a great job, you guys. Awesome job. I I love the scenarios, and like we said, different hospitals may do different. You may do things different, and that's okay. Again, there is no right or wrong here. We're looking to expand and educate. Right, every day we learn something new, and you know, to me, I'm reading your chats as well. We we all um, can grow from this experience, and that's what these case studies are about: is to um, grow from the experience. And uh, Camilla has asked to come to the ED because there we can have intake. Sign her up for med yeah for presumptive medical. Great. Um, we don't have an action set because we don't offer telehealth. Right. The patient needs to come to the emergency. That's fine too. Again, um, come to the ER. And I love that. And or Bright Heart Health, connecting them um, directly to a telehealth option. And believe me, I know all of our navigators, including our mentors, how many times have you just transferred to the telehealth. I've done that myself. Definitely. Um, you know, we give them so many options and it's great because remember our patients have not had any type of options before, um, before you came to town in this new role, there were no options. So even the fact that we're, we can offer different options is great. Um, whether is an issue, we can't do telemedicine, Jeffrey says, but would encourage patients to come to the ED. Definitely. I agree. Um, you know, start it, start them on bupe, especially, um, you know, if she's six hours out, you know, maybe the weather will get better. The roads will get better in another six and she can come in. So I just, I love all of these answers. Definitely getting them a, a telehealth appointment. Um, if the for underinsured patients, if hospital doesn't offer this, yes, absolutely. Um, we have a mobile med team that connects with them in the streets. Lisa, oh my gosh, I'm so jealous. I am 100% jealous of you guys because that is awesome. We do not have that at all. That is truly amazing. I would love people, uh, all, all of our hospitals to do that. Talk about low barrier. Um, that is like the best low barrier. So definitely thank you for that. Um, coordinate with the social worker in the hospital. Okay. Um, I love it. If patient was in the hospital, staff to assist and apply for Medi-Cal. You guys know this stuff. You guys are awesome. I love this. Um, and again, our our newer navigators, please read the chat because there is so much information in here um, that I'm not saying. And I appreciate every single one of you putting an action plan because remember, we're all learning this together. So this is amazing. Thank you, team. You did a great job. We're going to move on to our next scenario. And I just oh, wanted sorry, to- Sorry, sorry. We're going to go back to the action plan. Oh, this yes, the action. Is so- um, so one of the one of the important things that that we felt needed to be done was review the uh, withdrawal symptoms. Um, make sure that uh, we located a pharmacy that the patient could get to safely. Um, and then also making sure that that pharmacy has the medication on hand to dispense. 
because it wouldn't help um, relieve those patients' symptoms if the pharmacy has to order it in and it takes another three days to get it. Um, there might be uh, other steps as far as like connecting them to the county resource or access line for um, SUD and or mental health help. Um, and then making sure to follow up within uh, 24 um, hours just to see where the patient's at, how they're doing, how it's going, um, and, and invite them to come in if it's, if it's safe to do so. Um, maybe you don't have a scenario where a patient might be snowed in, but maybe you have a, a very rural setting where it the patient is hours away with zero transportation. There's no tra public transportation available in the area. Um, these are the kinds of things that um, might be helpful to think about um, as far as action steps and, and get these plans um, in place um, in the event that you come across this scenario. Great. So the, the, this is what our team came up with action plans. It doesn't mean right or wrong if your action plan is different because you know your hospital and your processes. So great job to everybody. And I'm still trying to read all, I have a very small window to read these um, comments in the chat, but they are amazing, you guys. I know you are working hard and I'm so impressed with all of you. This is uh, truly amazing. I wish I could uh, show everybody, all of our doctors, all of this wonderful action planning going on. Thank you, team. Next, we're moving on to our case study number three. This is a, a youth overdose, and our navigator mentors, Chaya, Vang, Tommy, Zinya, and Marianne will be presenting. What are they presenting on? This is 15-year-old Freddie. Freddie was um, overdosed on marijuana laced with fentanyl, and he came in by ambulance. His parents just arrived. They're divorced, don't speak to each other. And I'm going to hand it off to the team. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Zania. Is it, is it okay if I go see your patient in Hall A? It looks like he overdosed, and I just want to go in and see if I can offer him some resources. Yeah, that would be great. Let me know what happened. Thank you. Knock, knock. Hi, Freddie. Uh, my name Hello. is Kaya. Is it okay if I come in and talk to you for a few minutes? Uh, I am a navigator, so I'm here to help uh, people who use drugs or have depression or anxiety. Uh, I just want to let you know I keep everything confidential between me and you unless you are a harm to yourself or others. Um, I can refer you to substance use resources, counseling, um, and I can also follow up when you get home. Is that okay? Tommy, we're having, we can't hear you. We're having some technical difficulties. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go. Okay. I don't use drugs, but I think you have the wrong. Okay, oh, that's okay. Do you mind telling me what happened before you came in? What happened? I think you're saying you don't remember what happened and you just woke up in the ER, right? Right. Okay. Well, I am not a nurse or a doctor, but I want to tell you you came into the ER because you overdosed on fentanyl and EMS was able to come by and uh, revive you. That's why you're here in the ER. Knock, knock. Hello, I'm looking for my son. I'm looking for my son, Freddie. Hi, are you mom? Yeah, I am, I'm Freddie's mom. What's going on here? Hi, uh, I just came in right now to um, see Freddie. Uh, we haven't actually talked about anything yet. So um, Freddie, do you, do you wanna tell mom what's going on? Freddie, you're supposed to be at school. What are you doing smoking weed when you're supposed to be at school? 
I don't have time to come down here, Freddie, and and deal with you. Sick of this. What now? Who are you? What do you do here at the hospital? I want to talk to a doctor. I want to understand what's oh, going on here. My name is Chaya. I am actually a navigator. I'm here to help um, offer you resources. Um, such as family resources, or even getting in touch with a social worker, if that's something that you guys are open up to discussing about um, today. Has, can I ask, is, has there been any history of um, Freddie over um, having similar encounters like this before? From his I mean, marijuana Freddie use? is a problem. Freddie has always been a problem. I got five kids. He's the hardest one. I have four jobs. I don't have any support from Freddie's dad. So Freddie, Freddie needs help. Whatever you have to offer Freddie, we're gonna take it because I cannot be leaving my job, coming down here just so he can cut class and smoke weed. Okay, well, it sounds like there's a lot going on. I am going to offer you some resources for right now. Um, I'm also going to offer you a Narcan kit to go home with in, in case that something like this shall happen again. Um, that way you can help Freddie or somebody else. Um, in the what meantime, you, wait, wait, is, I'm going- Narcan? Narcan? You mean that stuff that you've been hearing about on the news? Why yes. does Freddie need Narcan? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we, I want to offer him the Narcan just because he is using marijuana. Um, just in case he overdoses on marijuana from take and maybe mixed with other substances that he may not be aware of. Um, just so it's just safety precaution, and I will definitely teach you how to use it. Um, teach you and Freddie, and give you guys a kit to go home with if you are. Of you accept that today. You know what? Can you help me? Can you help me call his school? He needs some counseling. And I don't know if you can be the person to call the school or if you know anybody in this in this town, but I can't go home with this kid like this. Um, that's something beyond what I can do, but I could definitely ask my social worker to come and help me with the situation. Is that okay? Yes, 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 please. All right, thank you. Um, I will be right back, Mom. Okay, I'm back. Dr. Zinia. Yeah, how'd I have it go? Met your patient. I have met your patient, uh, Freddie, and it seems like there's a lot going on beyond just his substance use. So I'm gonna get social worker involved and um, hopefully we can offer him some more services that mom is requesting for. Okay, that sounds great. Let me know if you need anything from me. And that concludes our role play. Um, I just wanna go home. Sarah, you're still muted. <laughs> Sarah, I think you're still muted. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, okay. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Tommy. Thank you. So I really appreciate the mentors for this scenario. Marianne, you're a great mom. You you sound like you have some. <laughs> Some experience being a mom, all right? Definitely. Well, what would you do that's different? You know, you guys have, you're dealing with parents, you're dealing with children, youth, and you know, um, what what is it that, that comes to your mind with this scenario? I know a big thing is a team approach, right? What was one of the things that Chaya had offered to the team? Yeah, great acting, mom. You know, Marianne, you, you missed your calling. <laughs> Definitely. Um, 
what what would you guys do? What would you do with this with this scenario? How would you do things differently? Um, you have a, a single parent. You have um, who's asking for help. You have Freddie who wants no help and doesn't talk and doesn't want to want to cooperate with anything. He just wants to go home. So it kind of fit the scenario that he couldn't talk because he was not helping um, the situation. He just he didn't want to talk to our navigator. Um, De-escalating mom and redirecting from blame to curiosity and understanding. That's great. Um, resources support. Yes, definitely. Uh, Chaya did. Um, absolutely help with that. Is there anything else you guys would do different? Maybe get them connected with you support services. Um, don't we need to get permission for the, from the son to speak to the parent? You guys answer this. What do you guys think? Do you need permission to speak to a youth? I'm going to let, I'm going to keep it, the look in the chat and see what you guys think. Okay, not if they're over 12. Okay, we're on to something here. Um, patients, parents need to be, need to give approval for MAT. For If a patient wants to speak to a counselor and wants counseling, they can approve themselves. So Josefina, you're correct. Only for treatment. Yes, absolutely. So there is your answer. Definitely. Do some of uh, follow up calls with mom and Freddie? Absolutely. This is a great opportunity because uh, the navigator has made a connection. Um, so definitely some follow up. But just rem remember, if the patient uh, parents uh, permission has to be for MAT only, um, a, a child can ask for therapy, counseling services, but they cannot, um, they are not emancipated. They, they cannot give permission for any type of MAT uh, treatment. All right. Okay. Any other questions on this presentation? Here's some of the questions, you know, what would you do differently, right? Does anyone have telehealth? There are some that will do like 16, I know, um, but it is hard to get telehealth for youth. Most of the time they want them to come in. If anybody knows some resources, please type it in the, in the chat, okay? Um, Des Destiny says, I know there's a lot of pressure with parents, especially those not so understanding. I'd explain a bit more about what happened, the risks of illicit drugs. Absolutely. And and mention mental health because we know um, our youth that are doing drugs most of the time, it's about a 40, 40, I think as high as up to 60% chance, they also have a mental health issue. So great, great thing to acknowledge. Um, offer mom some services. Absolutely, you guys caught that. Mom was needing help. She definitely needed help. Um, Destiny just put some resources in the chat. They have uh, La Familia Youth for Change, which is an incredible resource for students. So I love this. I love that we're helping each other because that's what this community is. We all don't have the answers, you guys. And um, helping each other is great because all of our patients are unique. Um, and there are substance uh, prevention programs, especially for our youth. Um, youth uh, Volunteers of America has one youth um, prevention program, as well as NAMI has youth prevention programs. So again, I, I really ask you to look those up and what, see what's in your city, because a lot of them are free services. They are absolutely free. Um, so definitely... Um, would like you to uh, look those up as well as offer mom some Ellen on support. Love that. Love that. Um, you know, the, I think we've gotten two of them from Ann and from Jennifer. Yes, I, I love that resources for mom. You guys are amazing out here. Elevate Youth California has services too. So again, if you don't know of these, look in the chat, write them down, look them up. There are so many here, um, some great resources. So I am so proud of all of you guys. We have one more slide. I'm going to show up the action plan. Does somebody want to talk about this action plan, how you guys came to this? <clears throat>
Xenia or Marianne, do one of you want to talk about what what was on here for the action plan? Nobody? Sure. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, so always following up with your provider after you um, talk with the patient and also just updating them on any kind of resources that you've provided. Um, making sure that your per, your patient um, and parent has the navigator's contact information for continued support. Um, you know, I always like to know what my what my resources are before I go into the room. So, um, you know, obviously you will be getting more information when you're working with the patient. And so then, you know, making sure that they have something that they're leaving with. If I like to have something in their hands or also there's a lot of apps now where people can access um, support and, you know, and meetings, especially for youth. So helping them to download those before they leave um, the hospital, giving additional resources to family members, um, giving naloxone kits and education to everyone. So making sure that, you know, obviously the patient has naloxone, but whomever is taking them home, that they know how to use the naloxone. And um, I always like to, to also send them with like a little YouTube video, but then showing them how to use it. Um, and then providing a follow-up appointment, regardless um, of if, it, it's a, if it's a mat need or behavioral health. So some kind of follow-up appointment with some kind of supportive service. That's great. Thank you. Great job, you guys. That is our mentor team. So shout out to them and their scenarios. Um, we've, we've been discussing question and answers. Um, so I definitely appreciate any other uh, questions in the chat. Absolutely. We have some time. Um, we purposely, you know, we always have action packed. So I'm glad that we have time to, <laughs> to breathe. Um, we always want to remember that addiction is not a moral failing. It's a chronic disease that requires medical treatment. Um, this is our resource slide. You can just download, put your camera on, and it will take you directly to California Bridge. Um, I do have a little time to share that we have announced our California Bridge Academy, and we will be, um, if you go to our Navigator landing page, all of our training, including our Navigator Training 101 series that goes through the whole Navigator Toolkit. Um, it's a 10 session series is on our California Bridge Academy. You can refresh and you, uh, you know, if you've already seen it, um, but you can log in and all the instructions are on the Navigator landing page. Um, it will also provide a, C, a KDAP CEU. So if you need those, if you want to go back and review, you take a test and you can print out your CEU. So we're really excited to announce that. It's open to everyone. Um, just go again, go to our Navigator landing page. I think Chaya put it in the chat. So please check it out. We're really excited to offer this. Um, definitely. You can also print out a certificate of attendance after you watch the, the module. So again, it's the Navigation Toolkit 101. And we also have some of our Navigator Focus series. There's five of them that are on on our California Bridge Academy. So that's the newest, latest and greatest that we're um, offering. So very exciting things happening. Um, for those that are in Southern California, our next in-person training will be in Irvine. We're really excited to see you in April. Um, please sign up early. We just need to let you know that our Oakland uh, training is completely full on Monday. Um, so unfortunately, if you have not signed up for Monday, um, we are at capacity. So if you um, intended to go to that, we we're redirecting you to Irvine April 21st. First. Please sign up early. Again, um, there is capacity um, uh, capacity um, um, limits, so we want to make sure everybody is um, can come to either Oakland or, or Irvine. But Oakland is already full. All right. Okay. Anything else? My thing is stuck here, so let's go. Okay. 
Um, if you want to contact any of our mentors you've seen here today, and I'm going to announce them one more time and come off camera or have them come on camera, please, mentors at californiabridge.org goes to all the mentors. So you don't need to remember their names. You just hit mentors at California Bridge. You can get any question answered anytime. Um, and so that is your lifeline, mentors at cabridge.org. We wanted something very easy for you to remember. And um, I, there's a question, uh, can you attend both? Ruben, it's going to be the same training. So if you want to have a repeat, um, we're going to do what we did in, um, on Monday. We'll be done the same in Irvine on the 21st. It's not new content. So um, keep that in mind if you want to attend both. It's the exact same same material there will be you know nothing new um if we have new content it'll be later in the year but for the most part um and if you attended in november in la it's the same content again so just want you guys to know that um these three are all the same one we're just changing different different locations what if your mat champion can't go doesn't matter you can come these are not a a mat champion a clinical champion is not um required anybody can attend um okay what if uh give me your space i am so sorry you guys we are completely filled at this time um, all right. Okay. Here are our mentors. Um, and I'm going to stop my screen for just a second. Because this is our team, you guys. And if you don't know them, um, please get to know your mentor. We have Nicole who's waving hi. She's from uh, downtown LA and she's um, helping us with the KP. If you're from Kaiser Permanente, you, you're you gonna um, belong to her group as well as downtown. We have Wendy Martinez and she is Inland Empire, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego, down in Southern California. Marianne Cox Gold is from Northern California, rural out, up there there um, beyond San Francisco, right? There's a whole other uh, other uh, community out there. There's Marianne. And you guys know Chaya, Chaya Vang. She's our, our program um, engagement coordinator. Um, and there, you guys know Tommy, our OG. There is the OG guy and Tommy Martinez in the house. We have Latoya, who does all things onboarding. Boy, are we grateful. She's She's plugging along, getting everybody in orientation. Latoya Mitchell, thank you. And Zenya, she's our newest um, Bay Area mentor. And you'll be meeting her in Oakland, um, as well as the whole team. So we we uh, lost one of our OG navigators, but we've gained Zenya. So we're excited. Um, but Tommy will be there. So, so many of you know the OG. He, he trained all of us. So he will be there. And if you didn't make the Oakland registration, there is a member cancellation. Um, yeah, please let us know. That would be great. We do have people on the waiting list. So, um, so you know, definitely communicate with us if you're canceling and if you wanted a num another member on your team. Again, there is a waiting list. So um, just let us know if you're coming. If we if you want to release your spot, there's plenty on the waiting list. And again, I am going to regroup and share my screen. You've met all of our mentors. We look forward to seeing you on Monday if you can. We're also on social media. Those are our call signs. And I am Sherry Cisneros. I'm the Navigator Program Director, and it is my pleasure to bring these webinars, and we hope you find them educational, and we're always wanting your feedback on what we can talk about next. This, the subjects came today from our Navigator um, Advisory Council. They wanted to know more about fentanyl and microdosing. So we hope we filled that, um, the void of, of your training, and if you have any more ideas, keep them turned into our way, uh, turn to our way. Any other final questions, you guys? Uh, we, we finished a whole two minutes. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.